Hope you have a, uh, a fabulous day today. There's more, there's fun stuff and serious stuff this afternoon, but um, I, I just, I, I was struck this morning watching uh, all of you walk in the building. I was in uh, Clarendon County, South Carolina a couple of years ago. Uh, until 1998, virtually every bicycle Walmart sold was made in the United States, and the price differential changed, so bike production went overseas. And when we started this endeavor, uh, Walmart, the governor of South Carolina, and a New Jersey bike company said, hey, maybe we could change that. So we bought, brought uh, bicycle assembly work back to Clarendon County, South Carolina. And it was really a remarkable effort. But the day we did the dedication, I was walking by myself through the plant, and I was uh, talking to, to workers who were there. And a young man looked at me and he said, you know, I, ha I haven't worked in eight months, and I'm really proud to have this shirt on. He tapped the logo he had on. I'm really proud of this. And he grinned and he said, and you know what? They're great bikes, and you can buy one a mile down the road at that Walmart. And at that moment, I was struck, and I think sometimes you might tend to forget this as suppliers, and we're gonna talk about this during this panel today. I was struck by, you are creating jobs, you are creating economic growth in your community, you are giving opportunities to people who maybe haven't worked in a while, you are creating better product for Walmart that our customers care about. So, I know we're spending a lot of time today talking about the technicalities of how we do business at Walmart and how we can buy more from you. I know most of you in this room are existing suppliers. How we can get better at making your product better to better serve our customers. But, but let's not forget that what you're doing um, makes a great deal of difference in your community. And you should feel good about that, and you should make sure your community understands that story, and that's another thing we're gonna talk about um, during um, this panel. Couple of housekeeping items. I wanna mention we have a great social event uh, tonight at the AMP, which is our music pavilion in Bentonville. It's, it's kind of a new thing. We get a lot of great concerts here and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a fun event tonight. Uh, Doug McMillan is hosting the event, so you'll have a chance to sort of mingle with Doug and a lot of senior Walmart executives and, and, and we're gonna have some uh, homegrown product there for you to sample. So I do hope you can join us at the AMP tonight. It, it's it's a, a fun event. Uh, the other thing I am going to show you right now are a couple of slides, and I, I wanna tell you, before I bring the panel up, I wanna tell you why uh, these slides matter. Uh, this is our uh, Walmart Jump portal uh, on the big screen over to my right, now on the all screens. This is the place you can go to really get every piece of information you need about what we are doing in terms of increasing how much product we buy in the United States. It's a great site and frankly, we have worked really hard the past couple of years to make this far more user friendly than it used to be. We think it's a, a dynamic living site. Uh, you can learn about the, the project, uh, the overview, um, certifications, organization, communication. The other thing you can do on this site, and I always remind people when they say, well, sort of how do I show my product to Walmart? By far the easiest way is to go to this site. You can load information about the product you would like the Walmart buyer to see, and the Walmart buyer will see it. So this is a great way way to check in on this site periodically and stay, stay up to date with what we are, are doing um, in terms of, of buying uh, US made goods. So uh, I will give you that address again at the end of this session, but that is a site that matters. Um, we have three great panelists today, and we're gonna try to keep this very conversational um, and, and talk about a couple of things. We're talking today about what is success in moving your production back to the United States? What is success in growing your business with Walmart? What is success in finding state and local incentives that are critical to your business as you think about either where you are located or where possibly you could be a better located? And also, so much today has been about the story 
of Walmart selling more product made in the United States of America and how that creates jobs and how that reinvigorates the middle class. But part of that storytelling should be how you, as a company, as a supplier, are telling your story in your home community. We have a company with us on the panel uh, who has done some innovative work with, with us uh, to tell their story. And frankly, I think it's a company that will admit they were a little cautious at first about sort of going public with us. But once we went out there, um, it, it changed sort of how they look at um, um, telling the story. We also have a supplier in the audience today, 1888 Mills is here, who is a company that in the very early days of our Made in the USA effort, um, 1888 Mills sort of went public and talked a lot about what they were doing with us. And we told their story quite effectively uh, in terms of, of uh, the towels they are making for our customers and the large Walmart supplier they are. So we'll talk about telling the story today. Um, I want to introduce the panel and bring them up one at a time. Dr. Dave Cranmer is the Deputy Director of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which runs the only nationwide network of centers dedicated to supporting U.S. manufacturers. MEP centers operate in every state and Puerto Rico and work with small and medium-sized manufacturers to help them with a wide range of services. Dave's team is doing some really unique things, um, and he's going to talk to us about that. Anita Hargett is a member of the Walmart team with great expertise on what tax and economic incentives companies are looking for as they seek new locations. Anita has a strong working knowledge of national trends in this area and the challenges faced by small and mid-sized company, companies looking to navigate fiscal incentives. Nick Santaleri is a VP of Manufacturing at Rockline. Rockline is an example of a company that has expanded the amount of product it sells Walmart in recent years. This sales growth has not only led to the creation of jobs, a new facility, and expansion of two others, bringing their total to three in Arkansas, but it has also resulted in a major supplier of raw materials also coming and following them uh, to Arkansas. So we have three distinct and different perspectives. And again, we're going to keep it conversational. We're going to save time at the end for some uh, questions. And um, Dave, let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about what your, what your uh, program is and how uh, companies find it. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. I this is on. Yep. Um, we're a $300 million public-private partnership that essentially helps small manufacturers, wherever they are in the US, improve their operations, grow the top line, and develop the workforce talent they need to have the future they want to have. And that's the short version of that. OK. Anita, tell, me, tell us what you do at Walmart. And when we're looking for a new location, what are the things you are looking for as you figure out where a super center or a Sam's Club or a neighborhood market should be? Okay. Um, I work for the tax team, but I also assist with the real estate. We do a lot of the site selection for the distribution centers and then also the corporate properties. When we're looking at locations, there's a lot of different factors involved. And to, to make it short, we have to make sure that we look at all the internal stakeholders, um, outline their wants and needs, and make sure that when we're looking at sites, we address all those needs. So um, in short, it's all about the pre-planning that's involved. And Nick, talk about your company and the growth in recent years uh, in terms of business with Walmart. Sure. So I'm a vice president of manufacturing and sourcing for uh, Rockline. Um, Rockline's a, a family company um, headquartered in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, we have uh, eight global factories. Three of them are in Arkansas. And 2,500 employees. So, in fact, one of the VPI items that was talked about today, uh, we have Steve's VPI item. So uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty cool to hear that. Um, our first onshoring event actually happened 14 years ago, so way before um, the Walmart Made in U.S. initiative. Um, in fact, it's, I got it behind me, is this one. So we started production of this in, what a pick. we started production of this in the U.K., and we moved it here to the U.S. Today, that item is the number one selling item in Department 2. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, more recently, and Joe talked about this last fall, we held a pretty public event, and yes, we were nervous about that at first, where we opened our doors to the community. Um, news, the community, the local authorities, 
and um, took them through our factory and where we were onshoring or reshoring a product that we had made in Eastern Germany and uh, Northern Italy, and we brought it here to uh, Springdale, Arkansas. So uh, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about that, um, and we also learned the benefits of opening our doors to the community, and I'm sure Joe will talk a little bit more about that later and ask us about that. Just a question for all three of you. Just the general climate right now uh, for companies like this that are, that are watching today, where do you think it is for manufacturing today versus five years ago? Are, are you optimistic? What, what are the trends you're seeing right now? Uh, Dave, why don't we start with you and go down? I mean, for, for us as a federal program, we get to look at a lot of companies well beyond just suppliers to Walmart. Um, there are still 300,000, give or take a couple thousand, small manufacturers in the U.S. And from our perspective, they're coming back. But they're not coming back across the board. Um, what you see is those who are able to add value and have less labor cost associated with the assembly and production are the ones that are doing better. The ones who are looking at and starting to think about new technologies, whether it be additive manufacturing, smart manufacturing, digital manufacturing, are the ones that are preparing for that future. So they're, they're the ones, I think, who are going to succeed over the medium and, and long term. Yeah. Anita? In regards to economic development and manufacturing, I would say five years ago, we were seeing a, a flux of companies going overseas. And then five, probably in the year six, they're, st they're starting to come back. So what we're seeing is a lot of the states and the local economic development agencies, they're not using the same model that they did about five years ago. They're being a little bit more creative, creating a lot of um, different incentives to entice those companies to come back to the U.S. and reshore. So um, when you guys are looking at new facilities in the U.S., I would just make sure you have clear communication with economic development folks. And um, as far as incentives are concerned, I know we had a question over here about when do you ask the state or the local governments? It's both. Um, they both have skin in the game. They're really I'm excited to uh, recruit you guys, especially listening to Governor Hutchinson. Um, if I, I don't know who wants to open a, a facility in Arkansas, but I think everybody did after that speech. But I think they, they're just becoming a little bit more aggressive. Now, Anita, Anita before we leave you, do, do you think the states are more aggressive now? I think so, because there's more comp competition. Um, and I hate to say this, like it's more from an economic development perspective. Manufacturing companies, they produce jobs, investment, add to the tax rolls. There's more competition, more on the state side, especially the states, their budgets are being cut, so they have to get a little bit more creative. Most of the incentives I see are also on the local side with property tax abatements. Um, so there's a lot of incentives out there. You just need to look and, frankly, you just need to ask. Nick, your company sort of pre and post Walmart, what, what, what has been, I know you can't use too specific on numbers, but, but how would you describe sort of the changes for your company? Well, the, the change happened to us when we went deep with Walmart from a transparency perspective. I mean, prior to really opening up our doors, if you will, um, we had nice double-digit percentage growth year on year. After that, that doubled. So it, there was a step change in that. But as far as if you go back to the, um, more about the state of manufacturing, our supply chain for manufacturing is people, right? Um, and our challenge from that is, and, and U.S. manufacturing, is making manufacturing cool again, right? For a long time, manufacturing wasn't cool. So, and I know a lot of people use that phrase, but how do you make it cool again? Um, one of the things that we're doing is we sponsor four robotics teams at, at the high school level in Arkansas. And these are kids that typically wouldn't play football. Okay, and they are rock stars at their school when they get into these competitions. And they are seeing what manufacturing is and it's making it cool again. So I see it on the upswing from that perspective. One of the things we have heard a lot from suppliers through this whole dialogue is the you know, quality of workforce. 
Uh, tonight at the AMP, uh, you'll see it, it will be parked sort of right in the middle of things, but it's a big 16-wheeler truck, and it's a project we did with Arkansas, and they outfitted it so you can walk through this truck, and in it you see different examples of manufacturing uh, high-tech equipment. There's actually a game where you can see uh, how good of a welder you might be, and it gives you a score. Um, so it's an interesting truck that we have helped underwrite, and it's going from high school to high school to high school. School, um, in Arkansas, uh, where they can uh, uh, take uh, young people through it. And uh, someone mentioned it a few moments ago. I mean, the, the, the stereotype is that manufacturing is dirty, scary, and doesn't pay that well. And there are many young people in this country who are not headed for a four-year degree who I think we all can help better understand through projects like this truck, uh, that it's high tech, it's clean, and it pays very well, and it's certainly a very viable alternative uh, for kids who are sort of coming out of high school and, and trying to figure out what comes next in their life. So I would encourage you, if you get a moment tonight, to, to take a, a look at the truck, because I think anybody on any side of this discussion uh, would agree that um, workforce uh, is, is, uh, is pretty uh, critical. Let's go a little deeper. Before you leave that topic, one of the things that, that we've done at the Department of Commerce is started an event called Manufacturing Day about four years ago. And our goal this year is to have an event where somebody can visit your manufacturing facility on October 7th in every county in the country. And that's a great opportunity. We've seen a lot of high school kids go through those facilities and decide manufacturing really is cool that we want to work here. There are a couple companies have used it as recruiting tools. They'll take the kids who, have, who are the smartest ones and say, we want you to work here now based on what we learned about you at Manufacturing Day. So they're using it as a, as a pre-interview, if you will. Why don't you talk a little bit about where you, where you find your workforce and some of the issues that you deal with right now. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have to go deep, what I call deep in the supply chain. So we're going at the high school and we're trying to identify individuals there. Um, recently, I had a superintendent of a school district call me and said, and asked, Nick, how can we put programs in our schools that'll help you? You know, when we went to school, when I went to school, which was like a million years ago, we had Votex, vocational schools. Um, they kind of all went by the wayside, and I think that's what you're talking about, Joe. Um, and I see some of that coming back again, um, a little bit. And, and that's, that's how we kind of fuel that through, through that, through that vehicle. And that's how we have to get uh, folks kind of really invest it in, in manufacturing again. Anita, we have companies here already doing business with Walmart, successful companies of different sizes. Any thoughts on if they have some production overseas and some in the US on when is the logical time to be thinking about what they might want to bring more back to the US? What's the starting point for that thought process? I think there's um, just looking at your business plan and also their transportation costs. I know we had a couple of slides from the Boston Consulting Group about um, some of the drivers that are bringing manufacturing back, but also just looking at your business plan, looking at um, the, the costs are a huge driver, and then also looking at, the from a site selection perspective, there are a lot of companies are bringing their companies back here just because there's a lot of incentives as well. So I think from a manufacturing perspective, um, using the resources that are available from the federal and the state government, just like Dave's group, um, analyzing all the possibilities and then looking at the costs from each perspective. And when you look at the costs of the US versus, say, China, there is not that much of a difference if you look at um, the, the scale where the US was 100 and China was 97%. So I think it's just looking at the cost. That's probably the largest driver, but also the quality control. Another thing that I know that Nick mentioned was the workforce. So that's another critical component. When you're looking at the in incentives from the state and local governments, training is a huge part of that too. And there's a large emphasis right now going on among the states to try to beef up the training and get skilled workers. Now we have, if I want to get some, we want to, again, we want to keep this conversational and we want to get your questions. So we, we have some microphones. If, if you have a question, put your arm in the air and we will get let's, a microphone over here if we could. Um, here's, here's one. Over behind them. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Tom Naira from JTD in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my question was for Dave. We've looked a little bit and we've talked a little bit locally about the MEP programs. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the cost is to the manufacturers to get involved or have a consultant for the MEP to come in and then kind of is there a range of programs? Does it depend on what our needs are? Like if we were looking at trying to kind of do a lean manufacturing cell or whatever, are those some of the things that your, your program offers to us? Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, first, thanks for the opportunity to let me talk about the program. Uh, we do have a center in Florida. It's a relatively new one. Um, they're in the process of standing up now. But what they can't do, some of their sister centers could help them help you do. And that covers the whole range from lean manufacturing start to finish, whether it's I need a value stream map or whether it's I need a full-blown Toyota Kata program. Um, they can also help you with some innovation if that's what you need, thinking about what your future new products ought, want to be, because everybody in the company's got ideas about what might be next. Uh, I will say it is not free. Um, the fees that we charge go back into the program, um, but they are mostly designed to make sure that the company is bought into the results, because we've learned over the years that if we offer it for free, it's frequently not valued. So we do have, and depending on where you are, there can be state or other grants available to help pay for some of those programs. A question back here. If we have a microphone over here. Oh, here we have, right here. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I'm Scott McDonald with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I'd like to add, um, you need to talk to tribal nations as well. Uh, we recently uh, uh, attracted a uh, CNC metals. It's a micro steel mill to Duran, Oklahoma. The Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma is going to be providing, on top of the Oklahoma State and local incentives, another $12 million of cash. So there are some additional uh, resources out there, uh, especially in Oklahoma. We have very uh, strong tribal nations, and they're always looking for a relocation of any type of, of employment uh, to their areas. So I would, if you have any comments on that, I'd be... Happy to hear about that as well, Anita. No, I love that. Um, we historically, honestly, have not looked at a lot of the Indian um, facility or the Indian lands, but I know if Walmart does have a lot of facilities, uh, stores, and clubs within the Indian lands. But yes, um, I love the fact that you know Choctaw and a lot of the other tribes are getting a little bit more creative to attract the in industries, and you're probably partnering directly with the state and the local governments as well. So I like that. Anita, and let's do a follow-up. That's an interesting question. I think you're making a great point. What are, as you see it, are there things that people commonly overlook in terms of incentives? I'm sure there are things that everybody looks at first, but what is sometimes overlooked in terms of incentives? Um, there are a lot of statutory incentives that when you're talking to the state and local governments, they're going to give you an offer letter probably based on the discretionary. But there's a lot of statutory incentives like sales and use tax exemptions. I know we were just chatting about that. Um, a lot of those require you to file ahead of time before you purchase the equipment. Um, in addition, there's also training incentives. The, the states have usually have a training resource that they'll actually do the training for you. If you work with them, they'll create the, the plan for you and work with your even your providers that you are you know your trainers they will provide that you no know, cost to the company and a, a couple of other incentives from the federal government you know there's the work opportunity tax credit if you're in manufacturing you're probably hiring a good amount of targeted employees in disadvantaged groups there's a the federal work opportunity tax credit there's also research and development I know research and development is a huge um, portion of the manufacturing so there's many uh, there's a research and development credit that was just uh, in, renewed this past year and it gets ignored a lot and it does get ignored a lot <laughs> I want to say someone said there's like 10 billion allocation annually so that is something that you need to look at and then also there's a, a federal manufacturing deduction for your production activities we see a lot of companies they miss that so there's a lot of money out there just uh, they're statutory so I would definitely look at that Question back here. Hi, yeah, Libby Allman, Hallmark Cards. I'm curious to know if there are any new incentives around keeping manufacturing here. So we've been manufacturing in the U.S. for a long time. What kind of incentives are out there to continue doing that on an ongoing basis? 
There's a lot of retention incentives. Um, normally they're not as well advertised or there's not uh, on the state's websites, but there are retention incentives that they can do. And especially if you're increasing your headcount, there's also um, expansion incentives. Even if uh, the thresholds are maybe low, you may be even increasing your headcount by five. But there's a lot of those um, available out there. And then if you're buying equipment, the sales and use tax exemptions, um, and also, if you're retain, re retaining employees, sometimes I've seen states do a withholding tax credit, or they'll do a withholding tax rebate based upon your payroll. So there's, it depends on which state you're in, but um, I would definitely look. And your local economic development is usually the, the one that um, I think most of them have a retention arm that they'll go out and visit the companies and making sure everything's OK. And I think those conversations should probably start with your local economic developer. Yeah, let me just add, I mean, that, that's a great question because a lot of the states do a lot to promote you to come to their state, but not a lot to, to stay. Um, I, I would suggest that you work with the training arm of the state because they help tremendously. I mean, Arkansas has been a great resource to us. Becky Thompson is literally in our facility constantly because of that. And that is one area where they can help on the, on the retention. So, and I want to segue to one thing. So, we're talking about retention and why a state should care that you stay. And part of that, I think there's very often uh, a misunderstanding. People don't understand how many jobs you create. Or you're located in an industrial park in a quiet area where people sort of drive by. They don't know you have 200 jobs. They don't know you're doing 180 million with Walmart. Um, and I think when we talked about sort of uh, what we did with Rockline, we invite, it's a fairly simple model, but we invited one morning the city council, state representatives, state senators. We said, put some coffee and donuts out and, and bagels. And everybody mingled and had a coffee. And then we had uh, Cindy Marsiglio, who you saw this morning, Cindy spoke. And we had uh, company executives talk about what they do at the facility. And we had Walmart talk about why that is important to us. And, and what they make there, and how many people they employ, and what their workforce issues are. And great media turnout, local bunch of local elected officials. And then Nick's team took uh, clusters of 15 people at a time and toured them through the facility. Um, it, it's very much like we did with 1888 uh, in terms of saying, here are the complexities of bringing textile production back into the United States, and here is a large supplier partnering with us to make that story uh, better understood. And I bring that up at this point in the conversation because if you want a state or locality to work hard to retain you, it, in, it's inherently true, I think, that they have to understand what you're doing. And once they understand what you're doing, the mayor is going to always sort of have a better understanding of what Rockline is doing on the backside of that community uh, in terms of what it means to uh, uh, jobs and families in his town. So uh, is there another question over there? I, and before you get off that, no, I, can go ahead. I can guarantee you the congressmen and senators always are looking for places to go visit. Yes. Uh, everybody loves the announcement of, of new jobs, but uh, the uh, sort of explanation of existing jobs, I, I think, uh, is equally as important. And we have a question over here. I actually just had a comment um, based on the incentives uh, that can be offered. I work for a municipality in Texas, and some of the incentives that we've offered in the past are land grants, um, uh, reduced land at, uh, at land at a reduced cost, and also infrastructure uh, incentives as well. Um, that can be a, an expensive part of the, the site selection process and, and getting your operations up and running. And we've worked with companies and, and helping them kind of offset some of those infrastructure improvement costs. So just wanted to make a comment on that. No, and can I just comment on that? And I appreciate that because a lot of the companies don't realize all those upfront costs that the city or the county is putting into the project, those are costs that offset the company's initial capital investment. So yes, we've seen a lot of the land grants, donations, the utility, the infrastructure. Um, you assume that the utilities may be at a site, but there's a lot of costs that go into that. And also with timing too, and, and the permitting and the fee waivers, I think that those are helpful as well, so yes. So a question, uh, Dave, and I want to start with you, and I want to ask Anita the same question. So talk about geographic differences you see in the climate right now, or do you see geographic dis differences in terms of what's going on out there? 
there are huge geographic differences. It, each, each state is unique. Each county is unique. Each town is unique. Um, each one will have a different propensity for wanting to have manufacturing operations in their area. Um, there are actually very few counties in the U.S. that don't have any manufacturers. Um, but how badly they want you will dictate what incentives they're willing to offer to help you locate there, to grow there, and to stay there. Do you see commonality? All over the map. Very little commonality. No, no commonality? Very, or no, not very, one region is not generally more manufacturing friendly than another? The, the Midwest tends to be more friendly than the others, but it depends on where you are in the Midwest as well. Anita? I agree with Dave. <laughs> Each state and local um, municipality is so different. And um, I can't say that one region is, is more um, competitive than another. But I can tell you some states are definitely more competitive than others. And any of you that have gone through the competi competitive process of looking at various sites from different states, you might have an incentive package. One may be you know, on a bar, maybe on a scale of one to five, one. The other one could be like a, a five. Um, and it's also the incentives are going to differ based upon the tax environment. Um, the lower incentive, maybe have, they have lower taxes, so they're not going to offer you as much. But I think it's, um, I would say, historically, the South and some of the Midwest, there's some states in there that are very, very competitive. So um, you're just going to have a wide variety. Yeah, and actually, I mean, Governor Hutchinson said it today, there's, there's not four layers in between me and you. He's right. Um, and that makes a lot of difference. Um, Governor Beebe before him was the same way. You pick up the phone and you call him and he call you back if you needed something. So uh, there are states that are, are much more friendly to that. Now, let's check just as an example, use your company's evolution. Um, how did you, you're Wisconsin owned, right, based? And then you came to Arkansas and then did expansion within Arkansas. Was that because of the proximity or were there just factors here that you liked? We bought a factory, we bought a company in 1989. Um, and then as we looked to expand, um, we looked at the logistics implications of that, as well as the incentives and, and proximity. And they all play a factor. Um, but definitely Arkansas was uh, very aggressive and very welcoming. There, uh, there, was no, there was no red tape, and that was key. And now one of your big suppliers of raw material has followed you here. Yeah, we worked with, uh, in, in concert with Walmart to uh, um, attract one of our largest suppliers, and they made a commitment to invest $80 million in uh, a factory in Fort Smith. So they're going to be right, out, right outside our door. Oh, it's, uh, it was a good win. And that's precisely why the state and the locals are so eager to help your company, because they know that's just a catalyst. Um, there's going to be others that come, suppliers or um, other manufacturers also. We're going to be coming to the door as a follow-up. Questions? We, we have a few minutes. If, yes, sir. We'll get a mic over here. And while we get that mic over there, um, Dave, reiterate how people find you. And... Uh, you, there is a cost for your service. There is a cost for our service. Could you give us a sense of how the cost is structured? It tends to be more like a daily rate, as you would see for most manufacturing consultants, generally $1,000 to $1,200 per day if you, if you took the project and divided it up. Um, you can get us in two basic ways. There's a toll-free phone number, 1-800-MEP-4-MFG or go to our website, www.nist.gov slash MEP. Okay, and is your typical client someone starting a business or trying to expand a business or across the board? We are across the board. Uh, we are in fact right now trying to work more with rural, very small and startup manufacturers. Typically we've worked with companies that are 10 million in sales and up. Um, but there's no inherent reason why it needs to be that way. Okay, question over here. You had spoken about the uh, benefits both from town, counties, states, et cetera. Is there any specific uh, listings that where some of these states or counties are more beneficial to move towards uh, based on uh, human asset um, or raw material? And in turn, uh, are there specific industries that, where you would direct you know, different suppliers to, to say, 
for instance, whether uh, targeted production, raw material, or human asset that would be best? Is there like a, a listing of that where you could like break that down? Because you say the Midwest might be more uh, welcoming, uh, but there might be other benefits, east or west coast, et cetera, from a logistics standpoint. Is there a common, whether it be a website or a source that would be beneficial for multiple suppliers? I'm going to give all three of you a shot at that. I'd like to sort of get your uh, different perspectives on how do people can gather up that type of information. Yeah, from an incentive standpoint, I don't think there, there's one um, comprehensive website. I think um, there's uh, actually a lot of resources on Jump. If you've ever been on Jump lately, we added a lot of like site selection tools, um, a lot of free resources. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> no worries. There's a lot of free resources on there as well that you can look, but I don't know if they're from an economic development and site selection. There's not one website that can tell you which is better. Um, from a tax perspective, I know there's a tax foundation that tells you which is, has a better tax climate, but um, as far as incentives, there's not one comprehensive one. Yeah, obviously every, every business is different and they value things differently within their, their cost structure. Um, I was gonna I was gonna plug jump too because I think there's a tool on there to do some present values and, and balance um, working capital and shipping costs and that and the likes versus your local manufacturing. Yeah, and one of, one of the other tools that's available to you is a total cost of ownership tool mm -hmm. that any of our centers can help you walk through here's what it takes to make this product, ship this product, and deal with some of the risks of having either very short or very long supply chains. And one thing Walmart Corporate Affairs has um, a role we have played in this is we are willing to try to connect you with state economic development leadership teams. We have a corporate affairs team located in 50 states and we've worked closely to try to put together uh, high quality meetings of value where a company is saying, you know, yes, I would like to take a deeper look at uh, Tennessee or South Carolina or Rhode Island and we connect you with economic development leadership um, and sort of have that conversation. Um, we're also doing some different things this year. Uh, we're, we're looking more at everybody who came here today, all the suppliers in terms of what state they are from, and sort of sort of cataloging uh, the, the the different levels of interest from different states. But we are always willing to try to make that connection, and that's something that that we're working with the business on to you know, help facilitate our suppliers having an easier uh, point of access uh, with uh, a state economic development team. There's very often with companies not a, you know, it, it can be a little confusing to navigate the channels as you want to start um, not just figuring out what one state has to offer versus another state, but simply figuring out who you should be talking to or speaking with in, in a given state. So we, we are um, happy to help with that. I can get you more information about that. I want to piggyback on that too. I think that's critical and it's ideal to have a, a Walmart introduction to the economic developers. Um, and just as a plug for the economic development teams with the state and the locals, they have project managers. So they're going to be there as a resource for you. Uh, any information that you need, um, if, even if you're looking at sites, um, they will help you make those tours. They'll make those connections with you for the local governments. Um, and also utilities are critical as well. The project managers, they also have research people and staff. So if there's an information you need on certain communities, please utilize them because that's what they're there for. And so. Time for a couple more questions. Yes, sir, right down here. We got a microphone headed to you. Um, a few people have mentioned uh, that the first step in this process is really just doing the math and seeing if the numbers pencil out. Um, if you're finding, if you've got a product that may be more labor intensive and the numbers aren't quite penciling out, um, is there any directive that's given to uh, the Walmart buying team uh, to place a, a premium on US made products versus overseas? And, and how do you kind of work that balance with trying to drive down cost and sometimes seeing that US manufacturing is a little bit higher? And I wasn't sure if somebody had some experience with that or. I know it's not an easy question. It's a well, I, I, um, I had dinner last night with a group of companies from Michigan, and we sort of had this conversation. I, I, I would make um, a couple of thoughts. Um, I'm constantly 
astounded by the level of knowledge of the product area that a buyer has in a given area. I mean, I, I used to joke to my wife, I had been around the Walmart coffee buyer, and it's just astounding what a buyer knows about uh, American coffee drinking habits and what we're all doing in the kitchen in the morning when we make our coffee. Um, so our buyers sort of can always work with um, any supplier on that conversation. But at the end of the day, you know, we're still looking for a great product at the right price that our customer wants. And we're not going to artificially move that equation um, you know, to, to buy a product made in the United States, but, but we are, uh, and as you've seen today, you know, our, our day began with senior leadership at Walmart uh, talking about why this matters. We lit up Twitter. We're going to close the day. You're going to be at a social event with Doug McMillan. I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways, we're sending the message today that this, this matters to the company uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, but to your question specifically, I think it's w the buyer working with you to define the right product for the right audience. And as we also remind people all the time, you know, we don't, we don't roll everybody out in thousands of stores. I mean, our buyers look at a product and say we might, um, you know, try that in 300 stores in the Midwest. And, and as you heard the good news this morning, we're basically sort of taking every product we look at today and, and it will go online. So, I mean, we have a lot of good things happening, um, but, but I, the, the long answer to your question is that I think the buyers have a, a level of expertise to work with you on that. Time for maybe one more question, then I'm gonna send you to lunch. So let's, uh, one more, do I see a hand? Okay, let's, I wanna start with you. How do you see the future? Are, are you optimistic on, on where uh, manufacturing is and where the economy is? And, and, what, and tell me also what you worry about. Well, that's an open-ended question. Um, I, the, the future, again, I, I'm looking at the history and seeing momentum. So the momentum is going in the right direction. We, we are getting the support, um, uh, even, even on a national level, from the Manufacturers Association and, and places like you know, the, the chief executive, those type of things. Um, they're really supporting U.S. manufacturing in addition to uh, in the Walmart. Um, the, the headwinds <laughs> are going to be things like that happened last week, you know, in in in, in Europe, um, as well as uh, some of the um, shipping challenges and some of the lower cost shipping that we're seeing coming in the country. Um, they're, they're the headwinds, um, but the the <laughs> I guess the key is is to continually improve and to continue to reduce your costs and working with your public sector and your private sector. Reach out to your companies next door to you and see what they're doing. When we open our doors, we learn something every day. Someone comes in and says, you know, we saw you doing something. What about this? And that's the benefit. And then we reciprocate. And uh, so, you know, don't, don't, don't be shy. Anita, I think citing a super center is way more complex than most people understand. So tell us sort of what you're optimistic about in the future, where you see sort of all of this going, and what do you worry about? Um, I don't have a lot of worries, but <laughs> no. Um, I think from a, from a future perspective from regards to economic development and incentives, I think the state and locals are going to continue to be aggressive, especially with the manufacturing. Um, they're going to want your jobs. They're going to want your investment. Um, they're going to continue to be aggressive in those aspects. And then from the incentive standpoint, there's a lot of the incentives that will help offset those upfront costs and the capital costs. If you say the numbers don't work, are you looking at the incentives that can offset some of those costs? So I think um, just some word of advice is just make sure you're looking at everything holistically and not just say your first five years, but also please consider the incentives and also the tax environment too. So. Dave? I think for me, the direction manufacturing is going is very positive. It's much more positive now than it was five years ago. I think the potential is there for manufacturing to really make a comeback in this country. What I worry about are the politicians that don't really understand what manufacturing is and what it does for the country. And uh, on that note, I want to remind you once again where I began today. You 
you all as suppliers, as valued partners of Walmart, you do a lot for the country. You do a lot for our company, we appreciate that. You do a great deal for our customers. You're smart people, you, you are contributing in your, in your communities, you are creating jobs, um, and branch out. You know, have a relationship with your local community college, have a relationship with your school superintendent. Build your workforce. Ask yourself as you're flying or driving home from this, does the mayor and the city council understand what I do? Reach out and, and tell your story because telling your story is important in terms of bringing back the middle class in this country uh, to where Walmart thinks it should be and to where it should just be because simply it's the right thing to do. I'm gonna give you one more look at this slide uh, and remind you that uh, all the information you need on an ongoing basis, walmart-jump.com is a great place to get information. We have a huge white tent set up in the home office parking lot with a delicious barbecue lunch. So go have lunch. We'll see you tonight at four o'clock at our music pavilion, The Amp. Um, thank you for being here and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks.